Hello and welcome. Um, my name is Alejandro del Castillo and today I'm going to be talking to you guys about how to keep up with open source innovation. So a little bit about myself. Um, I work for NI, have been working there for, for a while. Um, and I will say that my involvement with open source goes back about 10 years. Um, and uh, since then, I have big projects uh, at NI that uh, use open source or, or let me uh, experiment with different technologies. Uh, these are some of the projects that I've been uh, working on. Um, and uh, O Package, it's a project that I maintain. Um, there was a session on it uh, in the morning if you want to go back and, uh, and listen to it if, if it's uh, of interest to you. Um, I'm also leading the Open Source Guild um, at NI, and that's going to be the, the main topic of my um, presentation today. So I'm first going to cover a little bit about how uh, how's been the involvement of NI with, with open source. Um, then I'm going to spell out the problem that we found when we started using open source more, which is uh, how can you keep up? Um, then I'm going to be talking about the open source guild. Um, and at the end, there's going to be some time to uh, answer questions. So please um, put your questions on the chat window. And uh, there will be time at the end uh, where I'll go over the questions and and share some of my thoughts. So before we start, uh, I want to say that I don't claim that I have figured this out. This is a, a super hard problem. Um, also, I think um, at NI, for example, um, we have some groups that are very well versed on open source use and others that not so much. So um, an organization like the Open Source Guild have helped us a lot to uh, cross-pollinate, to make sure that, the, that we radiate some of the knowledge that the groups that are uh, good at using open source um, uh, have acquired uh, over the years. Um, I will say that at NI, the Guild has improved our collective um, open source uh, IQ. So I want to share my findings uh, during this process. Um, and we'd love to hear how you guys have tackled similar problems Here's my email address. Uh, please feel free to contact me directly or um, over Slack uh, during the conference. So we have, if I had to pick one project that um, was super important to um, the way we use open source at NI, I will go back 10 years and, and pick this one. Um, so back in 2010, uh, we wanted to modernize uh, the family of, of uh, controllers that, that we sell. Um, so at NI, we, we sell controllers like the one you see on the, um, the picture you see on the screen. These controllers have a CPU, and then you can put cartridges for the different type of I.O. that you need. Um, they used to run a, a proprietary uh, OS. But back in 2010, uh, we decided to modernize the, the platform and run uh, Linux with a preempt RT uh, patch. Uh, and then we sp spin up uh, a whole group uh, in charge of creating a OE Yocto based distribution um, that will be you know, running uh, in these controllers. Um, so my involvement started here with open source. Uh, I was part of the original team. Um, and I will say that um, we moved to Linux back then and we haven't looked back ever since. Um, this was a, a great decision. It gave us a, a huge lift. Um, but it was not all uh, free. Basically, if you're going to adopt a project like uh, Linux with the preempt RT to be very core to your platform, you need to, you need to invest. You need to engage the, the community. Um, so, so we did. Uh, we joined the Linux Foundation in 2015. And we also were founding members of the uh, RT Linux Collaborative Project, which is a Linux Foundation project in charge of making sure that the preempt RT patch uh, makes it into the uh, mainline. Um, during this process, 
we um, ended up uh, maintaining a couple of different sub projects. So I became the maintainer of all package because uh, uh, we use the package manager uh, for OE very extensively and uh, there was an opening. So I stepped up and Julia Cartwright was the a stable RT uh, maintainer for a couple of years. Um, below are some numbers of some of the contributions that we have made for OE and, and the Linux kernel. Um, and I'm showing that uh, just to convey that uh, if you are going to adopt a project to be so core to your platform, you need to engage. Um, and you need to engage to make sure that it is going to work for your use case. Um, so back then, uh, that's kind of like the lesson that we learned. So fast forward in a few years, um, this was another project that I think was uh, seminal to how we use open source. Um, so we had these controllers and now we were tasked with creating a platform that will um, make sure that they were running specific versions of software, make sure that they were healthy, make sure that we were getting um, logs out of them and present those in a, um, uh, you know, UX friendly way. Um, so we're tempted to go ahead and do what we know and just build our own thing. However, um, building on the knowledge that we acquired during the Linux RT uh, project, um, we decided to not do that. Um, we determined that there was um, a, a trend of heavy investment uh, already for system configuration management for data centers. So there was a lot of investment on the cloud to be able to manage uh, all these uh, VMs. And um, we decided to use one of those solutions, uh, specifically a uh, SolStack, um, and adapt it to our use case. So it was not a perfect match. Um, we required to uh, run on uh, Windows and there was no master Windows support. So we had to add that. Uh, it was missing some modules um, and also uh, it was very memory hungry. So we decided to invest on the project and make it work uh, for our use case. Um, so we engage again uh, quite heavily. Uh, we did the Windows master port as well as a, a, a bunch of other features. Um, we develop pretty strong developer, uh, develop, de developer to developer uh, communication with, with SolStack, which has been uh, great. Um, and we even ended up in a few uh, working groups. Um, so if I have to summarize the learning from, from this experience, is that uh, it pays off to adopt a higher level uh, open source projects, um, even if they don't do 100% of what you need, even if they, they do 80, you are going to be better off if you invest on that extra 20%. Um, it's tempting to say, well, the project doesn't work exactly for what I need. I'm going to scrap it. I'm going to do the whole thing my, uh, myself. Uh, but actually, I will uh, argue that uh, if it does about 80% of what you need, uh, you should consider in just working with the project to extend it to do that extra 20%. A nice side effect of these two projects is that um, the developers that work on them uh, became evangelists of open source when they move on to, to other projects. Um, so we started to build some um, core uh, number of developers that were uh, very well versed on uh, open source. So with all this knowledge, um, now we want to leverage more. And um, the question is, how, how do you find the, the next project that is going to fit what you do uh, very well and is going to give you a, a big lift? Um, and this graph I borrow from uh, my colleague, uh, Michael Phillips. Um, what he's showing is uh, on the x-axis uh, is a timeline. Uh, and on the y-axis is showing uh, a software stack from the bottom to, to the top. Um, so for example, uh, Linux came up uh, to live in 1991 and you know it's an uh, uh, OS category. Um, Apache was uh, about 96. Um, 
what the line uh, uh, tries to convey is that uh, open source is commoditizing software uh, starting from the bottom of the, st the stack and is, is, is going up. So for example, in 2005, uh, you won't consider uh, buying a compiler unless you have uh, very niche needs. Uh, you will just use GCC. Um, same thing in uh, 2010. You probably won't consider buying a proprietary uh, a web server or building your own. You will just use a, a very well-established, uh, strong uh, web servers like uh, Apache or Nginx. Um, and that's kind of what we did with, with Salt in 2014 when we started the project. Maybe it was not completely clear that um, the ecosystem has already coalesced uh, in the system configuration management space uh, around a couple of options, uh, but it was fairly clear. Uh, so it, it was tempting to build uh, our own thing, but we decided to just go ahead and, and use uh, one of the solutions that already had a, a strong community around them. Uh, and by the way, that graph ended in 2015, but this has just accelerated. Um, and I will say that the higher you go up the stack, uh, it's probably uh, it's got probably going to translate into higher leverage. Um, but, also it, but also it means that you're going to have to spend time um, adapting that project and making sure that it's going to uh, work for your use case. And that's not trivial at all, uh, especially now that we are uh, talking about whole platforms that uh, are being uh, uh, open source and foundations and communities built around them. Um, so as an example, we were recently looking at, at Kubeflow um, and the stack of Kubeflow is, is gigantic. Um, it builds on top of Kubernetes and then it has serverless um, via Knative, which then serves uh, models that you could build in TensorFlow, PyTorch, etc. Um, and then there's a database where you're storing all this. So it's a very complex stack. And if you adopt it instead of building your own, you're going to get a, a very big leverage. Uh, but it's not going to be that straightforward. Um, and by the way, um, in top of all this, uh, uh, Qflow also has the whole Jupyter stack to uh, train your models. Um, so just to give you an idea of how, how gigantic the ecosystem is, uh, in 2018, uh, GitHub created this blog post uh, where they were saying uh, they reached a milestone of 100 million public repository. Uh, last week, I went ahead and did a query, and then that number was already 270 million, which is mind-blowing. That's a gigantic number. So with an ecosystem that big, uh, how can you keep up? Um, the ecosystems are moving really, really quickly. Um, it's hard to identify the disruptive technologies that can make a big impact uh, in your organization. And then sometimes uh, a problem has uh, different implementations. And then how do you pick the one that, that is going to end up winning? Um, so, so this is a very hard problem. So one way to uh, try to filter the gigantic ecosystem is to, to look at growth rate. So if you do that, you know, you could uh, see a, a graph like this, where uh, if you are looking at Kubernetes package managers, you see that Helm is there. Uh, and that gives you some confidence that that project is uh, getting energy. So uh, you might say, OK, I'm going to take a, a deeper look there because there, there's energy in that project. Um, another metric that you could use is contributions. Um, so again, looking at this graph, you could say, well, yeah, like Kubernetes and TensorFlow, those are clearly two projects that are seeing uh, a lot of movement. So if you're looking to uh, a container orchestrator, orchestrator or, or a machine learning uh, framework, uh, those will be high on the list of uh, projects to look at. Um, so another 
prism that you can use, and this is actually one that uh, we've been using quite a lot, is to look at foundations. Um, so um, I see foundations as being the custodians of open source. Uh, they already filter projects based on metrics. Uh, so, uh, you know, if a project is uh, in incubation state, that means that is, you know, just starting up, uh, the projects that have gone out of incubation uh, can give you some confidence that they are uh, actively maintained and, and they have a, a decent community uh, around that, around them. Um, Okay, so this painting is from Rembrandt. It's called the Syndics of the Drapers Guild. Uh, so basically, uh, the Syndics of the Drapers Guild uh, were elected people from the guild that will look at the different clubs that the uh, weavers from the Weavers Guild uh, will bring them, and then they will uh, look at the quality, and only the ones that have certain level of quality will be approved. Uh, for the rest of uh, the guild to, to buy. Um, so in a way, I, I think that kind of matches the uh, mission statement of the um, open source guild. Um, we we'll try to look out there to all the different clots uh, and do some filtering that then we can uh, radiate to the rest of the organization. So the mechanics of the guild, uh, are, are this. Um, at the very beginning, we uh, each member look, they look at uh, um, different projects using all the different filters that I mentioned, and they bring uh, all the projects of interest uh, to, a, to an initial meeting, a, a, a pool of projects that uh, look relevant. Um, and we try to uh, apply some filters like foundations, you know, uh, contributions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but also, you know, trying to see if um, the project could be relevant to, to what we do. Then we have a discussion uh, on each project. And here we try to uh, use filters like uh, disruption potential, like if this project a, a, a game changer, and then uh, also try to filter it uh, uh, on, on relevance to what we do. Um, another filter is internal awareness. Like if a project is very well known uh, within an eye, then you know, there's no point for us uh, to look at it again. So, um, so we filter and then we get you know, this, this uh, smaller pool of projects uh, that deserve a deeper look. What we do next is that a uh, one guild member uh, spends uh, between a few days and a week uh, taking a deeper look at the project. Um, we usually try to uh, have demos uh, around them and uh, focus on how can this project uh, be applied at NI. Um, then there is a presentation where we have the guild members, but we also have stakeholders that we think uh, could be interested in, in the project. Uh, the presentations usually take one hour and then this, uh, they're followed by a half an hour uh, internal discussion on how can uh, this be applied to, uh, to an eye. Then uh, as a group, we decide uh, this is relevant uh, or not. If it's not relevant, then we just stop there. Uh, if it is relevant, uh, it moves to a uh, next stage. In the next stage, we try to uh, engage uh, other venues. So, um, for example, uh, recently we have a presentation on um, graph databases. And there are some projects uh, that use uh, graphs internally, but they don't use uh, databases. So we ended up uh, engaging uh, tech leads on those uh, particular products and representing uh, what the guild found so, so they can uh, then uh, run with, with the technology if, if it's appropriate. Um, we have some other presentations like um, um, on col columnar uh, databases. 
uh, which are more broad. So then what will happen is that they may go to different venues like our internal tech exchange called uh, NI Tech. Um, and yeah, there are other venues when we usually redirect uh, uh, like uh, VP technology exchange, those are So the structure, we, we meet only once a month uh, for those presentations that I just mentioned. Um, each presentation uh, has an owner. So the guild member it's, um, should present on the topic or should found someone that will present on the topic. And we keep a, a schedule of about uh, one year ahead, um, a backlog. Uh, but we revisit that uh, backlog to make sure that it's uh, still relevant. Um, and I will say that uh, on the Guild, we have a healthy mix of uh, long-time contributors to open source and less experienced developers that are, that are eager to learn more. So uh, we cross-pollinate uh, that way. I would like to mention that the Guild is not an open source office. Uh, it's a more organic initiative, uh, more bottom-up. Um, so we don't dictate a policy on open source or GitHub presence or any of that. Uh, but it's a venue for open source exploration. And I see it as an agent of change uh, to, to radiate best practices and, and how to engage with communities and leverage open source in general. Challenges, um, keeping the backlog relevant, uh, that's a challenge. I think we're doing okay, but uh, you need to constantly re revisit it because the business needs change and you have to be uh, responsive to that. Um, keeping the members engaged. Um, right now, that's not a problem for us, but that's something that is on my mind. Um, getting time commitment for the research, uh, that's also a challenge. Um, you need to either um, have managers that understand the value and then they give the developer the time to go do the research or you know do it on 10% time, uh, et etc. Um, I also think that um, we could be more strict about how we evaluate projects. Um, so uh, having an evaluation framework uh, is something that uh, I would like to have at some point. Some of the material that I presented here, um, it's in a case study by the to-do group. Here's the URL if you wanna check it out. The to-do group is an open uh, Linux Foundation sub-project where uh, open source um, program officers uh, used to exchange uh, best practices. And that's what I have uh, for today. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and answer some of your questions. Okay, so there's a comment here that says, okay, uh, buying a compiler, window is in a niche case and Visual Studio still bigger, but even then they give a lot of it away for free, likely because GCC, Clang are there as alternatives. Okay, so I think Brandon's point is that uh, the push for um, towards open source in uh, something like compilers have forced a uh, companies like uh, Microsoft to develop different uh, business models. Uh, for example, uh, Visual Studio is still a uh, big out there, but then uh, they generated VS Code uh, as a ramp up to, to, to Visual Studio. Um, and that's probably because uh, GCC, Clang and others have uh, came into, uh, into the ecosystem. Um, so yeah, Brandon, I agree. Uh, okay, I have another question here. Um, any open source projects you suggest uh, for getting started? Hmm, that's a hard one because if I answer, I'm gonna answer with all my biases. Um, <laughs> I think the Linux Foundation have a list of projects uh, that are good for um, getting started, um, but it, if you ping me uh, after the session, I would love to point you to some of the ones that I like, or can point you to some resources uh, that you can browse um, on your own. Um, I think we're... 
Okay, we have time for one more. What challenges you want to highlight doing open source at primarily a hardware company like NI? Hmm. So, um, that's a very good question. Um, I think at NI, uh, being a company that big, uh, the groups that are closer to hardware, uh, they find it more challenging to um, engage in, you know, higher up the stack uh, open source uh, projects. They, they, they're very likely going to be using uh, build systems, compiler, etc. Uh, but where the ecosystem is exploding is more in in in, in app software. Uh, I will think. So, um, at NI, I think um, it depends on your group and how much uh, exposure you're gonna get at uh, uh, to open source. Uh, I think it's changing quickly, but I do think that uh, app software uh, has, has it easier because sometimes like uh, uh, that's the only option. You, you, you're using open source software because even if you didn't want to, like that's, that's your only option. Okay, so uh, I would like to thank everyone. Um, Please uh, ping me on the uh, Slack if you want to chat more. I'd love to talk about this and uh, we can continue the conversation there.